my name is Missy Branch and I serve here at Southeastern as the Assistant Dean of Students to Women and the Director of Graduate Life. I'm also a student here pursuing an MA in Ethics, the Theology and Culture. One of the things that's true of Southeastern is that we are truly passionate about equipping students to fall in love with Jesus, to learn more about Jesus, to be transformed by Jesus, and then go and tell the world about Jesus. Today, we're going to focus on a few women who are here studying to get their advanced degrees. We really want to understand why, what brought them here, and how they use those degrees for God's glory. I'm excited to introduce them to you. I'm going to let them actually introduce themselves. I'm Julia Higgins. I'm the Assistant Professor of Ministry to Women here at Southeastern. I'm also the Associate Dean of Graduate Program Administration, and I just love teaching and serving the women here at Southeastern. I'm Sherelle Duxworth, a second year PhD student studying systematic theology, and I'm also a sociology instructor on another college campus. My name is Christy Thornton, and I serve as the Associate Director of the PhD program and the Director of the THM program here at Southeastern. I'm also right at the back end of my own PhD in systematic theology. So ladies, let's start off with the first question. So tell me, tell the audience personally, why do you study theologically here? Why, why pursue theological education? And then why at Southeastern? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, the starting place for me for the value of theological education is the opportunity to steward gifts. So for me, this is the recognition that the Lord has gifted me in knowledge and in teaching. And if that's true, I have a responsibility to steward that gift for the good of others, yes. both in the church and in the world. Mm -hmm. And places like Southeastern generally give us the opportunity to be able to grow as teachers and to grow as thinkers so that we might be really good at serving the church and participating in God's mission. And then why Southeastern? Because you can do this in a lot of different places. Right. And the truth is there are a lot of great seminaries that you can study at. For me, the draw to Southeastern is like maybe three or four things. I think first that at Southeastern, we really care about the Bible, really care about being faithful to the text, mm. faithful doctrinally, um, that we're being honest about what we believe in those things. But more than that, at Southeastern, we're doing theology, mm -hmm. we're doing our biblical studies with an eye towards the world. So there's no fear of an ivory tower, like we do theology so that we feel real smart and we're important mm -hmm. and all those people down there, they're cute, they don't know what they're talking mm -hmm. about. That's not what we do. We're really positioned as servants in the world and, but in the process, like culturally at Southeastern, we, we don't take ourselves too seriously when we do that. And uh, I think that's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. If you walk around campus, you'll see people smiling and joking in our staff meetings and in our faculty yes. meetings. There's a lot of jokes and a lot of laughter. And it's genuine because, hey, we're really serious about what we're doing, but we do it like fun. <laughs> yeah. like, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's absolutely. true. So I appreciate that kind of about, about our culture here. Yeah, so I think for me, um, I think when women hear theology or theological education, they hear something that sounds really weighty mm -hmm. or something that sounds kind of extra ordinary or otherworldly. Um, but we do theology every day. Right. Anytime we uh, articulate something about the Bible or articulate something about God, we're doing theology. And so for me, similar to Christy, I really wanted to be in a, a space where people would cultivate uh, my theological education, helping me to articulate about God and his creation correctly. And so for me, it was important to be in a space that would help me do that because theology is not just academic, but it's also spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. And so it's just helpful to be in an intentional space that's helping you to form spiritually, but also to be able to articulate correctly about God. Um, and I ended up at Southeastern in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. Southeastern wasn't my first choice, mm -hmm. not because it was a bad school. I just hadn't heard of it. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of new to the, the Southern Baptist space, but my husband really wanted to come here. Mm -hmm. And after prayer, it was just a place that I felt the Lord was leading me to come. I'm just in the, the midst of the social climate. My mm -hmm. husband and I really wanted to be planted in a predominantly white school to really help with uh, direction towards diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and Southeastern did have a, a strategy for diversity. Yes. And so we wanted to be at a place where I felt safe, a place where I felt like I could at least cultivate mm -hmm. my spiritual gifts. And so that was some of the reasons why I chose mm -hmm. Southeastern. Yeah. Awesome. When, when I think about theological education and its value, building off of what these two ladies just said, I just think about 
the simple answer is because it's just going to cause you to love God more. Yes. You're going to grow in your your love for God and His character and yes. knowing God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and then taking that knowledge and, and applying it and serving others. Yeah. Um, but also why Southeastern, I think about what Christy mentioned, how we are lighthearted. So mm -hmm. we have these kind of characteristics that we as faculty and staff know and that we want to inculcate within ourselves and within our students, that we are others focused, mm -hmm. that we seek to not think of ourselves first, but serve others. Mm -hmm. And then of course, lightheartedness. We, we like to have fun with one another. Like Christy was saying, I, every event I go to, whether it's faculty only or mm -hmm. faculty and staff or some kind of combination with faculty and staff and students, I always leave having had fun yes. and having been encouraged. Mm -hmm. But not only that, the third characteristic is that we are mission oriented. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Aiken likes to say that we don't take ourselves seriously, but we take our mission Absolutely. very seriously. And so we are all about the Great Commission. We are a Great Commission seminary and every classroom is a Great Commission classroom. Something that you said uh, stuck out to me. And so I sort of want to pose it as a question to you. Um, when we come to pursue theological education, we all come for a lot of different reasons, but one of the things that we ha have all found, I know personally, is that the studying of the Bible and to getting to know Jesus, A, lets you realize how much you just don't know no matter how far you go, mm -hmm. but also it begins a personal transformation. How have you been changed because you've been studying theologically? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question and a ginormo one. <laughs> yeah, I think of, I, I've been at Southeastern studying as a student for almost nine years yeah. um, mm -hmm. from my graduate work and then now through my PhD. And I think for me, the change, you know, I came in having been pretty well discipled. The Lord's really gracious mm -hmm. to me in that having grown up in an environment where I was taught the Bible and taught the scriptures and like driven to do mission. But there were all sorts of things that I like didn't know that I didn't know. Right. And so I came in having been like, you know, the goody two shoes, smarty pants, <laughs> I have all the answers. Like I'm the kid in Sunday school who's like, I know. Um, and so, but, but I didn't know. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Uh, there were all sorts of things that I yes. didn't know. And so I think um, that some of my big takeaways now that I'm kind of sitting at the end of my, mm -hmm. my time in as being a student in theological education in a formal sense, at least, you know, my big takeaways are like the the simple things are the things mm -hmm. like there's nothing more to say mm -hmm. than that God sent his son because he loved us yes. and that Jesus became human for us. And so I like I spend my whole life now thinking about this one thing mm -hmm. that God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. Yes. Like there's nothing else to be said. And I think I came in with this idea that there are all these like complexities and I want to say all the right things about mm -hmm. all these different things. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we are have this kind of robust understanding of what God's doing in the world. But man, it's all really centered yes. on this very simple statement that we learned when we were kids mm -hmm. that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Um, and I just marvel at the simplicity of this. And I think that's probably the biggest kind of yeah, growth for me beautiful. is this kind of awe inspiring understanding of what God has done in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are like so many ways that I've seen the Lord kind of grow me academically, mm -hmm. spiritually. I would say academically, I actually came to this space uh, feeling very inadequate, mm -hmm. like not feeling as if like academics were my strong mm -hmm. uh, place. And the Lord has just really been faithful to really like do some work with my mind to demonstrate like its ability. And that's just been personally affirming for me to see that what I bring to the church is my, my mind. And so that's been really encouraging. Um, also, I think studying theology, it makes you aware of the complexity in how people think, biblical mm -hmm. interpretation. You learn that theologians are human. And so that has really grown my compassion for Christians uh, throughout church history it's really grown my compassion for people who think differently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's taught me to be a lot more humble in my theological propositions or my positions. Um, and I think also it's taught me to love God more. Mm -hmm. Like just watching God's providence has been incredibly amazing mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Like just watching how, I think when you come to seminary, you think you have to do a lot of work and you do have to do work. 
but God is doing so much more of that work. Mm -hmm. And you really are just a vessel being used. And so all of that has been, those have been things that I've learned um, just kind of in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been super encouraging for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I think about time in seminary, it's just almost like the Lord stripping away everything, yes. you know, uh, things you thought you knew, like Christy's saying, mm -hmm. that you learned in church, but you realize you, you don't know anything. <laughs> yes. And so you're just <laughs> growing so much. And at the same time, uh, you might become tempted to, to be, um, you know, prideful over what you're learning. So mm -hmm. that can be a hardship in mm -hmm. for seminarians. It's like um, their knowledge way outpacing their, their mm -hmm. spiritual maturity. Yes. And so for me, that was a personal struggle. Um, mm. But the Lord just stripping away pride mm. and teaching you uh, about your humble dependence on Him mm -hmm. um, is something that will change you forever as you go forth um, and leave seminary to serve Him in ministry. That's good. Mm -hmm. That is so good. Yeah. Well, let me pose a question to you too. What are some of the resources that you've been leaning on through this process? I know that sometimes when you're studying, you find an author or a, mm -hmm. even a particular person in the Bible that is your person, and then you mm -hmm. tend to lean towards them. Is there people or books or things that have been your go-tos? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I wrote my dissertation on a particular theologian, so I'm <laughs> yes. kind of disingenuous yes. about being like, hey, Thomas Torrance was really helpful for me. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and part of my like, of strategy for a dissertation and really so i'll get to your question but, <laughs> but my like best position towards the phd was always that like i'm the product of my phd not mm -hmm. my dissertation so it was never about i have That's to write true. this thing it was mm -hmm. about what do i need to become what i need to become so that i can serve the church with the gifts that i have so to that end mm -hmm. i started working with a scottish theologian named thomas torrance who was such a helpful conversation partner for me He's wicked smart, super complex in his thinking, but he does that like in Europe in the last half of the 20th century with an eye towards mission, which is super weird. Like right. nobody's doing mission. Right. <laughs> and so he starts doing this really complex theology that's Trinitarian and Christocentric and looking at the world. And mm -hmm. so that became this really formative way of thinking. And he's ecumenical, which means he's a big fan of like the church unified across denominations, but he's not Baptist, but he's nice to Baptists. Yeah. And so that made him a really fun kind yes. of conversation partner. He's not thinking in our circles, but he's thinking kind of like us. Yes. Um, and so I think that's, he's had a significant influence on me um, as a resource in my theological development. How about you, Cheryl? Yeah, uh, so someone asked a question. I took a seminar. I think last week, and we were kind of going around a circle. And the question was, you know, what's the hardest thing for you in seminary? And this isn't to like gloat uh, or to even be prideful, but I think a lot of people struggle academically. And I just haven't found, I'm super disciplined, like mm -hmm. super, I'm a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And so I'm probably gonna like work extra, extra hard yes. academically. Um, and so for me, the hardest thing for me has been finding a culture that holistically cares for me as a student. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is not only do I have theological needs, but because of the space that I'm in, there are emotional, spiritual things that I need. So I need to see myself represented, which I often don't see. I might need to read things that mm -hmm. I resonate with, which isn't always the case. And so for me... I have tried to cultivate a community um, outside of campus that really helps me to stay planted. And when I feel like leaving, there are people who will kind of pull me in mm -hmm. and say, no, like, remember that God has called you here. Like, you can leave, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying, like, mm -hmm. the Lord. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and Missy is laughing because she knows the person who, who, yes. <laughs> who does yes. that for me. Mm -hmm. And so it's that's kind of my resource is, mm -hmm. is not even, it's not academics, it's not professors, mm -hmm. it's not people who are in my cohort. It really mm. is people who I've kind of attached myself to and they've kind of locked arms with me and decided to walk with me through the process. And when I'm frustrated or I feel like, oh, I, I really wanted to read this or having to kind of do that double work of reading the mainstream information, but then trying to read for my context, there are people who encourage me who affirm me, who, who really see my struggles. And so though that's kind of been my resource, like mm -hmm. my community, my local church has been really helpful. Mm -hmm. 
um, Pastor James White is my pastor, mm -hmm. and he's been really intentional to uh, carve out a space for Duck and I to really help us to stay focused mm -hmm. and to stay encouraged. And so that's kind of uh, what I use to, to kind of stay the course. That's beautiful because I think all of us could attest to the fact that there's no huge task that we undertake that we don't do it mm -hmm. surrounded by community if we're going to do it well. So I think that that's true that even though we may have a book or a, a particular prayer partner or something, we require community to really run hard in this Christian race mm -hmm. and to be excellent. So that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is, what is the hardest thing that you've had to overcome in pursuing mm -hmm. your theological education? Yeah. Um, I feel like I just got the eyes of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I think for me, it, this is funny because people assume that I have a particular answer to what the biggest struggle is. Like when I step off campus, um, I always end up, you know, like if I go to other places where people are doing theology, there are always these moments that people like pull me into dark corners with <laughs> hushed tones or like, well, what's it really like <laughs> to do a PhD in theology at the right. seminary? <laughs> They're like looking for dirt. I'm like, I have, I have nothing for you. And so right, people assume yeah. that the biggest struggles for me are in the context or with people, but that's actually right. not a struggle at all. Right. Like people have been more than welcoming here at Southeastern. I wouldn't have done a PhD if it weren't for the faculty right. at Southeastern. Right. Uh, and so that's not, so the external things have not been a struggle for me one bit mm -hmm. in this process, but the internal things have. So mm -hmm. I think the, the most difficult part of the process is like me, <laughs> uh, whether mm -hmm. it's my own mm -hmm. kind of personal growth and maturity or just the reality that you know, I haven't seen a lot of people who look like me do this thing. Yeah. And so there's always, you know, any student who begins a PhD deals with what we might call imposter syndrome, where you feel mm -hmm. like you're an outsider yeah. and you don't deserve to be at the table. Um, and I, because I work in the PhD office with PhD students, I hear all of our students say that like all the time, mm -hmm. like, like all of our students feel that. But when there's no one on the table who looks like you, or there aren't many people, though that's changing in Southeastern, I'll say, there mm -hmm. are more and more women in our programs. Um, it's, it's harder to get over the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's been just a constant growth and trusting the Lord and his goodness and that he sent me here and constantly kind of sharing those moments with other people. I'm like, I really not sure if I do it. I don't think I'm smart enough for this. Uh, <laughs> people get in your face about it. Uh -huh. like, That's ridiculous. Right. Uh, you can trust Jesus and you'll be fine. So I think, I think the internal struggles have been the hardest part for me. Yeah, that's, yeah. So I would say for me, I don't necessarily have people who like pull me into the, to the dark corner. Um, but I would say I would probably have more of an answer if someone were to do that. So I think it's interesting that people d wouldn't assume that my uh, experience would be, I guess, tainted by those categories. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, uh, the hardest thing for me, kind of similar to my uh, previous answer, it really is just the discomfort with being in a culture that is so far removed from what you know mm -hmm. and so far removed from your own culture because you have this, you know, th this double kind of identity. And I know people don't really like those terms, but you are, I'm in a space where I'm a female and I'm African American. And so that makes, I'm really the face of two people who have not been present at the table. And so the people who are always at the front all, are often the people who experience kind of the most discomfort. And I'm aware of that. Like uh, I count, counted the cost before I came here. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not to say it's horrible here, but no, there right. are some, some, some things that I experience that make it harder. Um, and that could be anything from being in a class with curriculum that doesn't necessarily suit my context or not reading any African-American female theologians not seeing any African-American female theologians or theologians of color. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for me to, I have to convince myself that what I am doing is celebrated and that it's wanted mm -hmm. and that it's needed. And that's not saying that nobody ever affirms that, mm -hmm. but it's a work to remind yourself of that. Because if you go into a classroom and that's not the topic of conversation, it's really easy for your person to convince you like see this isn't right. it yes. wasn't for you sis like <laughs> it's easy for you to have that mm -hmm. and so for me the hardest thing is really the the constant battle of fighting to be here and fighting to give face to women who look like me or who have questions that I have um and so that's kind of the battle that 
that I face, and I think you would face that if you were in any culture yeah. that was different from right. your own. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's Southeastern. No. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just the reality that there is a space that I'm in that's just different from who I am and what I know. And so I'm having to do a lot of kind of comp compensating for, for that when I'm you know, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So hardships in theological education. Mm -hmm. So I had to dig deep for this one because okay. <laughs> I was in seminary from 2001 to 2005. So okay. it's been just a little bit <laughs> yes, since I've been a student. Yes. Uh, but thinking through um, the school where I attended at mm -hmm. that time, during uh, that time period, I can remember walking into classrooms there and um, there was maybe one or two other female students mm -hmm. in the room and we would always sit together. Yes. And I can remember one particular class, I believe it's an Old Testament class. There were some young men that when we sat in front of them, they just made comments, murmuring under you know their breath, um, specifically one of them making comments to my roommate quite a bit, you know, just mm -hmm. not feeling quite like you're invited into that room. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that, you know, today in 2021, it's a little bit different uh, in seminaries for women. Mm -hmm. I think that, that our president here mm -hmm. has made it known that uh, women are invited into these spaces to learn, and he doesn't want to hear of any kind of comments like that from the men on campus treating women in that way. So hopefully it's a little bit different. I, you know, I don't want to make that out like it was some huge hardship for me, mm -hmm. but just yeah, a little absolutely. bit of the experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of people come to get their degrees for a lot of different reasons. And so we overcome these hardships, we see ourselves transformed and we lean on our resources, but then what are we going to do with that degree? And in, in my position, women come in my office and they have a million different reasons why they're pursuing theological education. Some, I just really want to be able to serve my local church. Some have an eye towards a job, a career in ministry. Others, my husband has this job and I want to be able to come alongside him. What are the reasons why you have chosen to pursue theological education? What do you want to do with it? And do you see yourself doing it already? Or do you think it's going to be a struggle, but I'm going to fight for it? <laughs> For me, it was um, because I just loved teaching the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when I initially went to seminary, it was with hopes that I would grow an understanding of the Bible and how to teach it well. Um, and I thought that I would graduate and go back home to Alabama and maybe teach Bible in a Christian school. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a professor who took me aside and was like, you know, I think you have some giftings in teaching and why don't you consider getting a PhD? pursuing that and I was just like ah, oh, that's you know that's right. not really for me I'll, I'll apply to this program but I won't get in and that'll be the end of that um, and so I did get in mm -hmm. and you You're know like, I gotta do this now yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, the Lord has opened this door and so he um, has just equipped me with with education that I didn't think I would ever do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not teaching the Bible in a Christian school, but I am teaching uh, in higher education. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord had uh, plans for me that I just didn't see coming. I love so, it. Yeah. I love it. How about you, Cheryl? Yeah, so I actually, I became a believer in 2011. And once the Lord kind of revealed to me that I, that I was gifted in teaching, like I've never been okay with not teaching in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean like teaching a Bible study. Mm -hmm. Like I just need to like utilize my gift in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And so I've always prayed and asked the Lord to give me some kind of op opportunity, whether that was discipling or talking to two friends about something that I, mm -hmm. that I learned. And I remember when I was thinking about um, pursuing theological education, I was thinking, what is the possibility like this degree is not going to be used. Like mm, I'm right. probably, it's possible that I won't uh, be hired anywhere. And so I took a year to pray before I actually decided to do the PhD work. Um, but I remember Dr. Higgins actually said this to me. Uh, and I think I might've asked you a question about just like using her gifts or not being able to teach. And one of the things she said to me was that she decided not to fight anyone to allow her to use her gifts. Mm -hmm. And I remember that was such a turning point That's for me beautiful. because I was like, you know what? I don't need to like convince people to use me. Like God would, would make room for that. Mm -hmm. He would give me opportunities for that. And so at this point in my life, I'm very much comfortable mm -hmm. with using my uh, theological education in the way that God intends. 
right now, uh, I'll do something like a Zoom session where I mm -hmm. teach students about sanctif not students, my friends about sanctification. Mm -hmm. And so my friends who are, you know, they would say laypersons, they're not in theological education, they're stay at home moms mm -hmm. and in the military. And so I'm taking what I'm learning and I'm giving it to them. Right. And so that's where I am now with using my theological education. I also leverage it in how I teach as a sociology teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I would hope to be able to utilize my abilities to help uh, provide information for the church, like help them to think maybe about different questions or about different things. But I'm content with using it the way that God would allow me. And even if that means teaching my mama about right. the Trinity, yeah. <laughs> that would just be the way in which I would use it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, how I ended up in theological education and what my kind of um, desires were in that, are, the answers for why I did a graduate degree and why I did a PhD are like very different. different yes. I'm like a completely <laughs> different human mm -hmm. kind of in, in between those. So I initially came to Southeastern as a theological education skeptic, for starters. I was like, I don't know what y'all are doing, but I'm not sure if I'm in for this. Um, it's true. And um, people don't believe it, but I really was. But I came here because I wanted to serve internationally with the International Mission Board. To go internationally with them, you have to have 20 hours of seminary credit. And I was mm -hmm. like, all right, guys, I'm going to be here for 18 months and I'll be done. And I'll be done. Except <laughs> that was like nine years ago and I never right. left. So that's <laughs> on me. Um, and then, so, so eventually, kind of in the middle, the Lord closed the door to me going overseas. And eventually I came back to finish my graduate degree because I had this moment in the context of a small group Bible study where I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm like good at school. <laughs> I had no idea. It was one of the most odd moments in my life just because I really had always been good at school. It was always natural for me. I never really thought of anything of it. Like, isn't everybody just good at school? But like, they're not. Right. Uh, because the Lord actually uniquely gifts people in the body. Right. Um, and so I had this moment where I kind of realized that that was true. And then I said, all right, well, if this is true, I should go back and finish my graduate degree, but then I'm done. Um, and then I had, you know, a, a series of professors at Southeastern who pulled me aside and were like, Christy, we really think you're uniquely gifted. Have you thought about doing a PhD? And I laughed in their faces because that was the most <laughs> ridiculous suggestion that right. I had ever heard. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, I think the Lord really has gifted me in mm -hmm. knowledge and teaching. And if those things are true, then I have a responsibility right. Mm -hmm. to serve the church. And then the other pieces were, you know, in some of my graduate level classes, I wasn't assigned a lot of works that were written by women. Mm -hmm. And the reasons for that are really complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Some because we're a confessional institution. And the truth is, there aren't that many resources that are confessionally aligned with Southeastern that are written by women. Mm -hmm. And then the reasons for that are also complex. Right? Yeah. So there's a, and some of it's good, right? Some of it's because we grew up in an environment that had a high value for family. And it is challenging to write high level theological texts with toddlers in your house. I, I can see right? that. <laughs> like, I can like, see like, that. like it's hard. I can see it. Uh, and, so, and I'm a big fan of family too. So like I get that. And I thought, but I like really am a complementarian. Like mm -hmm. I really am. Mm -hmm. And I like really believe that God has gifted men and women, has created us differently mm -hmm. and commissioned us to participate in his work and complement one another yeah. in that. And so if there are spheres of the church's ministry, like in theological education that exists to serve the church and raise up leaders and participate in their, in their formation, but there aren't men and women partnering together in this environment, man, I don't think we're, we're being as good as God made us to be. Like, I feel like we, we can do better than this. And mm -hmm. I thought, what if I can help? Yeah. Like, what if I can help? Like, I don't think I can fix all of our stuff, but I'll give it a shot. And so I applied and got into the PhD program. And I'll say at the front end of the PhD, the future felt very opaque mm -hmm. um, because people talk about you know, uh, degrees that lead to jobs. So if you have a particular idea of theological education is to check this box so that I can right. get this job, <laughs> like that was, no, like, for my, in my head, that was like never going to happen. So it couldn't be that. So it was primarily me stewarding my gifts. 
But the Lord's been so gracious that like, man, I really do have opportunities to serve in theological education to help do this. And I think that's been one of the biggest surprises of my life. Wow. Um, I never thought I'd be able to use this degree in a professional way and to be able to steward those gifts. But man, people really are looking for us to do that thing where we have women that are participating alongside men and partnering together to participate in the mission. And that's happening at Southeastern. That's happening in conservative evangelicalism, other places in the SBC as well. Yeah. And I'm like over the moon about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Something you said has um, made me think of another question. And I'm posing this to all of you, but I would like you to start, Cheryl. As an African-American woman on this campus, I think of the women who have come before me. I think of the women who have laid groundwork. And often the women that I think of are not necessarily from a theological space, to your point. Um, but I think of other females, not even all women, <laughs> Ruby Bridges, you know, who mm -hmm. decided to take, who was forced, she's a kid, but who have made steps forward and then we all benefit behind us. And so I do think that we're all motivated by the fact that women will benefit behind us. Mm -hmm. um, so as we think of the women who come before us and then we think of the SBC in its current state, um, we know Beth Moore has recently left and what we have heard and what we may see is that women will leave along with her what encourages you to stay? Why be here at this time in this season and work hard towards your theological education, particularly with advanced degrees where one could say, it don't take all that, you know? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's super, super simple. It's God's call. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that it would be easy for me to stay if I didn't feel like it would be disobedient for me to leave. Yeah. Like this, yeah. this is a place I feel like the Lord has told me to be. And if I'm being honest, there have been times where I'm in the process of checking out mm -hmm. and the Lord will kindly send people to remind me that he's called me here. And you said this to me about a week and a half ago, a, a half a, a week ago, you said, um, we need to know the goal mm -hmm. before we come. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, it's God's call. I know why God has called me here. I know that when it's time for me to leave, he will tell me to leave mm -hmm. if that ever is a, you know, is a thing. And so for me, it's really just knowing that God has called you here. Um, and I know some people have freedom to choose. Like, yeah. I feel like in, in certain areas or seasons of life, God allows you the freedom to, to make choices. Um, but I think for me, me being at Southeastern is the Lord has told me to be here specifically and so um, that's what encourages me to stay. Uh, and I will also say, too, I really do have a heart to see this multi-ethnic appreciation of the church. And the school that I, I come from was a SBC affiliated school. So it's not SB, it's not a part of the big six. And when I went to that school, I had come from the Mississippi Delta. <laughs> I went to a historically black college. Mm -hmm. And so my experience in a predominantly white space has been non-existent. Mm -hmm. So this is my second season of that. And I remember going into that environment and feeling the weight of being different mm -hmm. and just feeling like, oh, like, why do I have to be here? Like, it's hard. Like, people don't see me. Like, it's just exhausting. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting at a, a, a women's institute class and sitting by myself. And I remember the Lord said to me, you need to like work, like you have to work. And it was at that moment that I decided to like press into that space and do the work and mm -hmm. make people see me, like mm -hmm. make them love me. <laughs> and while I was working to do that, the Lord was doing this supernatural thing in my heart yes. to create this affection for yes. this space. And while some people might not want to be in a space like this, I do think Man, these are God's people. Yes. I love them. Um, they are my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I feel like there is a work to be done here that I could possibly contribute. And even if that means me getting hurt in the process or me having discomfort, there are a lot of other African Americans who've come before me yeah. who've given up way more for me yeah. to have access to certain things. And so I count the cost, but man, the glory and being able to see what I desire come to fruition. I was in a seminar last week and it was hard. And at the end of the seminar, one of the students said to me, oh, I'm so glad you were here. You raised questions that I would never think about. And I mm -hmm. left saying, Lord, thank you. Thank like you. you are a redeemer because <laughs> that whole week would have been, I would have steeped that entire week 
into the discomfort and the frustration. But just that glimmer yeah. of, of hope and that glimmer of, of difference was enough for me to experience that entire week. So that's kind that's of why, why I stayed there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ladies, why say, why be here now? Yeah, I mean, so I'm I'm from around here. Yes, uh, okay. These are my people. Like, I yes. grew up as that's a kid. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I yes. really am. As a kid, we took all of our vacations wherever the annual SBC meeting was. And like, okay, so, like, I yes. really am from around here. And um, yeah, and because of that, I'll say, like, this is family. Mm -hmm. um, these are my people. And through the ministries of Southern Baptists, who equipped my parents for the ministry, both my parents were theologically educated. Mm -hmm. Like I came to the, know the Lord through that ministry. Mm -hmm. I've served with the North American Mission Board, the International Mission Board. I've yes. participated here at Southeastern. And yeah. so the ministries of the Southern Baptist Convention have formed me to be who I am and have been such a gift to me. Yeah. Um, I love Jesus better for the ministries yes. of the Southern Baptist Convention. I know him actually because of that. And so I'll say as far as uh, the kind of state of the union, where, where are we right now as far as women in the SBC? I think it's complicated mm -hmm. because on the one side, you have some very loud, true and honest voices on maybe social media mm -hmm. or places that we're coming across that people are being not nice, yes. <laughs> like they're being hateful yes. um, and, and representing themselves as the SBC, which is mm -hmm. happening and is real. It's hard to tell how real social media is, mm -hmm. right? And how loud these voices are and how many people actually think those things, mm -hmm. even though the people who think them are very angry and loud about it. Uh, the other side is I'll say, you know, having, because I am from around here, in the last decade, mm -hmm. there have been, and even the last five years, more opportunities for women in the mm -hmm. SBC by a long shot mm -hmm. than for the decades before. Like we're in a season where there really is some significant growth yes. and, and more and more spaces in the SBC where women are using their gifts and serving, where they are welcomed and desired. Mm -hmm. And that's been a switch. Like even since I've been at Southeastern, that's, that's been awesome. a change. Mm -hmm. And for me, like there is so much hope, yes. like genuine and not mm -hmm. just like a fool's hope. I mean, it'd be mm -hmm. nice if this works out. Mm -hmm. No, like I can, we can talk about real people and real change and real opportunities where women are being welcomed in. And I'm like delighted that I get to participate in this. That's great. But even if you think about like what's happening right now, mm -hmm. like who had to participate in order for this event to happen? So like at Southeastern, right. there are three women who are serving as directors who had to help do this. Mm -hmm. And then two women that are serving as associate deans mm -hmm. that put together something like this. Mm -hmm. And for it's hard for me when people are like, man, there's nothing that women can do in the SBC. I, yeah. Look at right. us. <laughs> we're doing it. Like yeah. we are doing it. And, yeah. and we're not elbowing our way into those spaces. Agreed. Um, but that we are like for my whole life is, Hey, look, I, I made this chair for you to sit at this table with us. Did you want to sit down? And I'm like, I'm not sure if I can sit there and then I'll, but for real, you need to sit down. Uh, and then those Beautiful. were the men in these environments who were creating those spaces, cu cultivating my gifts, affirming me, creating opportunities. And there are so many men who are ready to do that and are doing it and working actively. So I, I get it that there are a lot of angry people saying not nice things and that that can be really discouraging because it really is upsetting that people think the things that they think. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is a whole world of people in the SBC that are very serious about creating spaces for women and mm -hmm. more open opportunity for women to serve their gifts than I think there's been in decades. Mm -hmm. And I would hate for us to overlook it because we're not yelling about it. Mm -hmm. Like we're just doing it. Right. Like we're not going to fight. This is like we're talking about. I'm not going to fight for a place to use the gifts. We're just going to use our gifts mm -hmm. and take seriously what we have. But because we're not yelling about it, I'm afraid that people don't always see it. Yeah. But like it, it's really happening. That's good. Um, and I would hate for us to overlook it. Yeah. And I'd say, why stay? I mean, because mainly because it's a work that Jesus cares about. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when I think about Jesus interacting with women in the Gospels, mm -hmm. think about him interacting with the woman at the well. He's calling her to faith and repentance and to discipleship. Yes. You know, and there's a part in that story where it says that the disciples marveled that he was talking with a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the study Bibles I've read says that that kind of shows their, you know, their attitude that it was a waste <laughs> of time to be mm -hmm. talking with a woman. But uh, Jesus didn't see it as a waste of time to call both women and men to discipleship. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about Mary sitting at his feet as a disciple. Uh, with Mary and Martha, Martha mm -hmm. serving. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says she's chosen the greater portion as a disciple, as a learner. So this is a work that Jesus cares about. 
of women being discipled and equipped. And mm. so that's why, you know, like Sherelle said, it's a calling. It's a calling for me to stay and to equip women, particularly in the degree programs that, that I'm helping with, to uh, make sure that, that that work goes on. Um, and so we can look at social media and get discouraged. That does happen for me. But I, I got to take my mind off of, take my eyes off of that and look to Jesus who does care for women. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's so encouraging for me to, to continue to stay. And, it, you know, we were in a meeting yesterday and I said to you, all of these things just keep happening yes. for us to be serving women in yes. different ways. I mean, you're, you're on, in student life helping serve women. Mm -hmm. I'm in the academic side. Christy's in the academic side. And there's just so much happening here that's exciting it's where beautiful. we can serve women. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, the Lord has called us here for this moment. So. so what I hear you ladies say is, of course, we don't look down on anyone who has had to, to leave, who has mm -hmm. felt called to leave for their own health, safety or whatever. Right. But for each one of you, there's a sense of obedience mm -hmm. and commitment mm -hmm. to, to this place and to this denomination that you feel called to. And I think that's beautiful because when we think of um, the Lord has a plan, I'm often, I often think of Moses when they, they were like, well, we're all going to go this way. And Moses was like, well, hold on. Oh Lord, if you're not going, oh, I don't go. <laughs> oh, I don't go where you don't go. <laughs> and so, yes, if the Lord is not calling me to leave, then I need to stay planted. That's beautiful. Well, we know that SBC is made up of 47,000 churches, right? I hear that all, all the time. And so of those 47,000 churches, you all represent three here. Um, what is, do you believe is the role of the local church in helping women pursue theological education? Yeah. <laughs> I well, guess you. I'd be happy to answer first. Yeah, I think there are a few different ways. Um, I think one is for church leaders, both men and women who are serving the context of the church, to call people out. Mm -hmm. Hey, I really think that you're gifted in yeah. this. I think a seminary might be a good step for you because I, I will say, so I work in the advanced degrees and almost every woman that I can think of that's in one of our advanced degree programs, it's not just me and Sherelle, by the way. Right. Um, <laughs> it's a whole gang of us. It's it's a whole gang of us that are doing that. Almost everyone has this moment where someone comes to them and says, mm -hmm. I think you're gifted. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's the responsibility of leaders in the local church, both yeah. pastors, small group leaders yes. who are interacting with these women to be able to identify their gifts and then encourage them and send them to be able to come here and, and continue to steward their gifts. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's one. I think the other is that um, church leaders have the opportunity to show environments where women can use those gifts mm -hmm. and not in a way that would challenge anyone's complementarian convictions, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying, hey, you need to stop being a complementarian because I'm a complementarian, right? right? right. So <laughs> I would say there are ministries in the church that would be inappropriate for women to do, mm -hmm. but there are so many things that they can do. Right. And I think making that obvious that man, we really because we're good complementarians mm -hmm. we really do want to leverage the gifts that women have and value them and give them opportunity to serve the church because we are better together it is better when men and women are serving together to mm -hmm. participate in the whole of life and so i think those two things so calling out gifts and also identifying areas where you can use those gifts so if you go and steward them i'd like to give you opportunities to do it both formally and in informally and so i think those two are kind of how i think of um, what the local church is doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, interestingly enough, um, I didn't necessarily have a person to tell me that I was gifted mm -hmm. or I didn't have a person. <laughs> the Lord is, is, has been really kind to me mm -hmm. because I didn't have a person to say, Hey, I think you should go here. Or most of the people's reaction to me is after the fact, like mm -hmm. they've heard something or they see something and, and maybe they affirm it. Uh, and so for me, specifically uh, speaking as a woman of color for women of color, especially those, those of us who are in Southern Baptist churches, I think what is probably important is for pastors and leaders to develop relationships with women of color, because that often feels really awkward. Mm -hmm. Like it is really awkward for me to sit down with a professor who's white, because I don't know what that relationship look, look like. The, mm -hmm. the same way when people people go through a lot of training to be missionaries because they want to be able to engage people in a different cultural context. Yes. Unfortunately, because I'm an American, I think sometimes people forget that we are different culturally. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's just really awkward. And so I don't sit down with a lot of professors. I don't sit down with a lot of pastors or leaders because I don't think I'm the person who they immediately see because I don't think that's the norm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that one thing that I would encourage uh, pastors and leaders is to really learn how to be with women of color, mm -hmm. learn how to engage them, how to have conversations with them. That's not awkward or that's not weird, but that is beyond surface level. Mm -hmm. Because if you are identifying the women who are gifted, it's probably going to be the women that you interact with because you're able to see their gifts more. True. And so if you don't know me, if you don't see me, you're not able to point anything out because we, we're not spending you know, any real time together. So I would encourage leaders to really engage, yes. like really get to know your Hispanic women, the Hispanic women in your churches, mm -hmm. like not just pushing them in a, in a Hispanic life group, but really learning them and, and taking the time to engage them. That way, when you interact with them, it's not, it's not that weird. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'm going to say making theology normal for women. Mm, Again, a lot good. of my friends believe mm -hmm. theology is something different. Yes. And even when <laughs> I try to, we talk about something like atonement theory, they'll ask me, why do we need to know that? That's so theological. And so for a lot of women, it's just not a norm to be involved in theological conversations. Theology is seen as, you know, something for men. Mm -hmm. And so I would say just making that a norm. So mm -hmm. maybe when you're hosting conferences or Bible studies, it's not that not just that you're bringing in a woman to do that, but maybe you bring in a man to talk to the women right. about theology. So right. then not only are you creating an environment of theology, but women are getting used to, they're kind of debunking the idea that men only talk to, to other men about mm -hmm. theology. And so those are two of the practical ways that I would kind of encourage pastors and leaders. I'm um, really be intentional about engaging women of color um, because a lot of times we kind of float to the back. Mm -hmm. um, even in this pursuit of women in theology, the women of color are at the back. Mm -hmm. And so I really think like just building relationships will be helpful and then just making theology normal. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what they both said is yeah. what I was thinking <laughs> yes, of already. Absolutely, yeah. And so I'm sitting here listening and I'm thinking of like, as you're talking about pastors identifying women, um, I'm just thinking of scriptural examples of that yeah. for maybe for the pastor who's listening to us and it's like, oh, you know, I, I don't really want to engage with the women because I just need to be over here with the, the men mm -hmm. and let the women take care of the women. If you think about like the Apostle Paul, you know, in Romans 16, yes. uh, six yeah. or seven different women that he identifies mm -hmm. and he talks about them being workers in the Lord, doing hard work in the mm -hmm. Lord. Talk about him, uh, how he talks about in Philippians 4 with Yodia and Syntyche, mm -hmm. how they are partners in the gospel with him, um, and how he tells Titus to, to make sure that he's overseeing women, discipling other women. So we see these examples, not only, I mentioned Jesus earlier, but Paul, who has these friendships and relationships where he knows the women by name, he knows how hard they've worked yes. in the Lord. So just that encouragement, uh, if we can encourage our pastors to continue to identify the women in the church and encourage them to to grow in the Lord and grow in their discipleship. That is so good. I think there are women who have been blessed to have pastors who have invested, mm -hmm. who see women as valuable workers alongside them for the advancement of the gospel. But what about the women who are at churches where there's just not an opportunity for them? Mm -hmm. Would you encourage them to seek out someone for that? or Because I do know that there would be that strange feeling of, mm -hmm. I, I see myself as a leader, or I see myself as a... How would you encourage them, maybe, Christy, to... Yeah, I think, um, one, there are a lot of things when you find yourself in an environment where you feel like things aren't right. There's So before I would talk about what you need to do, mm -hmm. let's just check our hearts in this moment because mm -hmm. this is a real opportunity for us to express Christ-like love mm -hmm. and a real temptation to not love like Jesus loves, yes. right? Because Jesus loves when people are really broken. Mm -hmm. And the expectation of Christians is that we love the church when it's really broken. And if you're not mm -hmm. sure about that, you should just read like Corinthians, both of them. Uh, the churches are so messed up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and in the middle of that is where you get this like the love chapter yes. is in the middle of the super yeah. messed up church. So let's not forget that particular right. context. That's true. Um, so I think one, and then the, the next step is, so when there's some, an, an area where the body needs to grow like how does God grow the body of Christ through the ministries of its members mm -hmm. 
And so if you're in a context like that, you recognize that the Lord has sovereignly gifted you a particular way. You see a church that's missing what you're gifted in. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that means that God is providing for his body to grow the body up in the maturity of Christ. So when you're in that position, don't let that lead you to frustration or anger. Mm -hmm. Let that lead you to joy that God mm -hmm. is providing for his church and you get to be a part of it. And after you do that, then you can act. Right? Right. So let's start, let's start with this kind of positioning of what's happening. Then you can, at that point, can't be that would start having conversations about it. Because in my experience, there are a lot of times that because of who I am or because of our backgrounds, we just see things in our context that maybe are a little bit different. Other people miss them. They have blind spots. That's true. Um, and so you have the opportunity to say, hey, I'm not sure that you're aware, but over where I'm sitting, it kind of feels this way. And I think this might be a way for us to grow. And when I've done things like that, man, I feel like it's normally been well received of, oh, man, I had no idea. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> what can we do about that? Yes. And it's not, again, it's not, it's not peaches and roses. It's not always well received, but I think we can presume the best and assume the best of the people that we can that we're going to kind of contact and begin engaging in this. Um, so I would say engage it. I would start looking for opportunities to use those gifts to build up the body because that's that's what you're there for. <laughs> that's why mm -hmm. you're gifted to do that in the first mm -hmm. place. Uh, and if someone else isn't helping you do it, hey, maybe you can build a community of people that you you guys can join together and start moving to serve the church in that way. But again, the Lord provides for his church and we can assume the best of the people that we engage. And my experience is when we assume the best of other people, they're a lot more receptive to what yes. you have to say too. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. What's been a sweet gift for me is coming to Southeastern A, like I said, realizing that I know nothing <laughs> and that it, I've been able to learn. But I think what's also been a sweet gift is being surrounded by women who are pursuing Jesus both with their whole life and with their mind. And I think that encouraging women to find women who are pursuing Jesus with their whole life and with their minds and really creating relationships with them. I think I am, I know I am better because I'm in a space with you three women and that there's a sisterhood that gets created just by this uh, unique drive to A, be to know God and to be known by him and then to not just keep that bottled but to share it. And so. That's a, I think, in our local church is really being able to find women, even if it's at the next, your sister church, but find women who would be like minded. And then, like you said, I just love it. Just have charity and grace because often blind spots and not always maliciousness is the that's reason right. behind why something may not be going on at your church. So mm -hmm. that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, probably last question, but I want to give all of you the opportunity to talk, to answer. So. What advice would you offer women in whatever stage they're in, including the mom with toddlers, including the older woman who feels like she is maybe past her prime? What would you offer? What advice would you offer women who do want to pursue theological education and maybe some of the hurdles they may have to overcome, but it'd be go for it? I would say begin just beginning with prayer, seeking mm -hmm. the Lord in yeah. prayer, seeking his will um, and and asking him to open the right doors and to lead you. If he's calling you to theological education, he's going to make that plain to you and open those doors. Um, also seeking just maybe advice from, from pastors, mm -hmm. you know, meeting with the pastor and, and talking it through with him um, and, and other friends maybe who have been. But beyond that, even contacting, like if you feel called to Southeastern or any mm -hmm. other school, contacting the school, and uh, sitting down and talking with professors, meeting mm -hmm. with them. So just seeking information so that um, as you're walking with the Lord, uh, seeking to do that by walking in the Spirit, He'll lead and guide and, and bring you to the place where He calls you. Yeah, when I talk to women about uh, theological education, I think the first thing that I encourage them to do is pray. Um, because, <laughs> and normally uh, my interaction is with either younger mm -hmm. women or women of color. Mm -hmm. And so I always will encourage them to, to really pray and make sure that it's something that the Lord is calling you to do because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for different people in different ways right. based on a lot of different yeah. uh, contextual yes. things. And so um, I really encourage them to do that. Also encourage them to find community mm -hmm. because when you 
when you enter into spaces consistently that are hard, it is very frustrating mm -hmm. um, because you to be I think to be isolated among Christians is one of the hardest things I've ever experienced in my life mm -hmm. because it's supposed to be this kind of communal environment. And so when you feel so detached from it, mm -hmm. that can mentally be really draining and that can take a spiritual toll on a person. And so if you're going into a theological space, more than likely you're going to be the minority because you're female. Mm -hmm. And then if you add other, if you add your, your race and ethnicity, that's going to make you a double minority. And that baggage will weigh on you. And so you really need community um, to really help kind of carry you through that mm -hmm. um, and really rely on that because they will kind of keep you focused on what you're supposed to do. And I think the notion that we're the church is because people are gifted in different ways. When I'm falling, my friends are at a spiritual high. And so they're able to kind of feed into to my soul and bring me up out of the trenches. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's helpful to be around people who can do that. So when I do want to get bitter in my theological pursuit, like people are there to remind me, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Like that's ungodly. Come, you, <laughs> you have to come out of that. So I would encourage them to pray, mm -hmm. really uh, count the cost, have community and know that God is glorified and you will be changed dramatically Amen. just in being obedient. And even if it doesn't affect people in the ways that you assume, like even if you're not speaking on a main stage, at a massive conference. Yeah, right? there's so much that you will earn from your theological education that even people won't even know. Like right. you'll literally be in your bathroom feeding off of like things yes. that you've learned and people yes. won't even know it. That's and so, so it's good. way, it's, it's so worth good. a lot more than even what it looks like um, on the outside. So. That's so good. Yeah, if you're in this for like self glory and like, yeah. Yeah, I'm not here for that. Uh, right, right. Yeah. You probably shouldn't come south Southeastern because right. we're not going to help you with that either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'll say, you know, in my conversations with women about theological education, whether from the certificate level mm -hmm. up through the the advanced degrees, there's one thing that kind of runs through both of those, and it's a, but like, can I do it? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, it is this? I I don't. Maybe it's not right. me. Right. Um, I don't know, but probably. That's right. I was like, I don't know you, so I can't. can't but you probably you. can. You can probably do this. Uh, because normal people do it all the time. Because, mm -hmm. like, we're not, uh, even the three of us, we're not phenomenally gifted right. in this. Right. Uh, we, we work women. really hard, and the Lord's been really gracious to us. But, like, I'm not the smartest person in the rooms that right. I walk in. <laughs> and it's. So yeah, you can probably do it, mm -hmm. um, and you can trust the Lord in that. Like, don't let your um, illusions of self sufficiency yes. stop you, right? Because right? you were never actually self sufficient. So do you feel weak? You're in the right place, is what the Bible tells us. So I would lean into that weakness and trust the Lord's strength in it. So that's a bad excuse not to do theological education. Yes. Like I will never accept it yes. uh, because weakness is normal in the Christian life. Mm -hmm. The other that I get, and this is a little bit more at the advanced degree level, a lot of women come to me and we have to have this like real kind of heart to heart before they start of like, am I, will I be valued at the table? Mm. Is there really a place for me here? And my answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. It may not be perfect. Your peers aren't going to be perfect, right. but my experience is yes was always valued at the tables that I came to. Doesn't mean that people, you know, didn't say stupid things every now and again, but even that was rare for me because mm -hmm. my experience in advanced degree programs at Southeastern, the PhD in particular, like I started having carried some wounds from other environments and, and I wasn't sure if I deserved to be at the table and I wasn't sure that I had a voice, but like the moment for me that made the flip of do I have a voice or do I not? Is when I looked around the table and all my peers were hearing me. Mm. Like I knew that I was speaking something that mattered when my peers were like, Christy, I think you're good at theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and that came from my peers in the program, right. much less the faculty members who kind of helped me get there and, mm. and have cultivated me all along. And so my answer to, but like, is it going to be a fight for me to be a woman at Southeastern? The answer is, not really. Right. Uh, we, we want you to be here right. so much so that like I help lead those degree programs, which isn't because I'm off awesome, but it is a statement of that. Like the institution's really serious about yes. women in advanced yes. degrees because women are actually helping to lead advanced degrees. Yes. Yes. Um, and so, yes, I think there are spaces for women at Southeastern. I think they will be valued. And to, to Julia's point earlier, 
you know, when, if women aren't treated well in the classroom, it's an offense yes. to the culture. It <laughs> yes. is not accepted. So if it does happen, like, let's talk about it, you know? Yes. Uh, and so those are my two. Weakness is not an excuse not to do it because you, you can trust the Lord even in mm. your own weakness. And yeah, you will be welcomed here. And if you're not sure, man, I'd love to talk to you about that a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, and I do think that there's also the truth that your value is not diminished because someone else doesn't recognize it. Right. Mm. So you mm. come in, you remember that you are valued and right. then you walk in that. So, mm -hmm. well, thank you ladies for being here. If you could give me one thing real quick, one thing, one reason why you're hopeful for women in theological education, what would you say? Well, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> because it's a hopeful time. Yeah. Look yes. around. Yeah. Awesome. Women are doing all sorts of things. We have more women in our advanced degree programs than we've ever had at Southeastern. We've doubled in two years. We're on the way to tripling in, in the next five years. Isn't it great? Right. And mm. there's so many opportunities for women to serve. And that's not pie in the sky. That's boots on the ground. It's really happening. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful here is that there are women here who are um, older, who are young, there are women here who are married, there are women here who are single, there are women here with children, there are women here with none, there are women here of color, there are women here with advanced degrees and studying in the certificate program, and it is incredible to see them come together as one community. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you for being a part of my community and for being uh, serving the audience this way. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to learn more about any of our programs here from certificate all the way up to advanced degrees, please uh, come to our website. It's sebets, S-E-B-T-S dot E-D-U. And feel free to reach out to any one of these women on the panel, including me. We would love to talk with you. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>